Hello and welcome to what we hope will be an interesting and exciting episode of Real Life. We haven't done a movie show in a while, but we hope to entertain you today. I am Mike Wigdor, one of the hosts, along with my friend and co-host and cinemaphile Frank Mendoza. Uh, we're here to present the show on one of the greatest filmmakers of all time and has done some of the greatest blockbusters of all time and highest grossing films. And that would be, of course, the one and only Steven Spielberg. So, Frank, welcome. And uh, this should be very interesting. I think these movies uh, are, are just amazing in themselves. Yeah, Steven Spielberg is one of those directors who really has, I guess you could say, two sides to him, uh, professionally speaking. Um, on the one hand, he, uh, for years, was the king of the summertime blockbuster. Those are the films we'll be taking a look at today. And then you also have the more uh, serious, socially conscious side of Spielberg. Um, that's the Spielberg that uh, produces and directs uh, historical epics or World War II themed films like Saving Private Ryan. But today we're going to focus on the so-called popcorn movies. And the first one that we're going to take a look at is actually the one that first put his name on the Hollywood map. It is a 1971 made for television film and it's called Duel. tell you this this movie this doesn't get your blood racing when you're watching this i don't know what does i remember seeing it on tv and uh i i remember him saying about it afterwards that it was like about um it was a killing machine and the funny thing about it is that you never see the driver in there that's just on this chase that gets out of control actually with uh, dennis weaver in this red valiant uh and, and, just never, and that's the movie at, at itself, trying to evade this monster going after him. Good precursor for uh, Jaws, I would say. Yeah, the premise of the film is actually very basic. So the fact that he was able to take this seemingly nonsensical uh, story and put it together into a, into a telefilm that really uh, was not only suspenseful, but, all, but also a really good happenger of things to come from him. Uh, as you said, Mike, I mean, this is really nothing more on the surface. It's nothing more than the story of uh, a salesman, uh, an on-the-road salesman, and without rhyme or reason, this huge truck behind him begins tailgating him and chasing him and mercilessly pursues him uh, all throughout the Southern California desert roadways. And the film really depicts just different scrapes he manages to get himself out of. Of course, the big question is, is will he make it out in the end? Who is this person driving this truck? And what is this person's motivation? And as you also said, we never do see the face of the driver of the truck that's pursuing him. So it really is just one big question mark. And in fact, they did have a, uh, they did have some, of course, behind the wheel. And that actor turned to Spielberg and said, what's my motivation for pursuing this poor protagonist? And Spielberg's response was pretty simple. He said to him, you're a mean, rotten, lousy SOB, <laughs> and you have multiple you have multiple license plates, which shows that you probably have done this more than once, and that this guy probably is not your first, uh, probably not your first target. Yeah, where did he get the idea for that? I I, I know that he had also directed Twilight Zone, uh, a couple of Twilight Zone episodes, um, 
But do you recall or where I don't I don't remember finding that info because it was a good precursor for Jaws and didn't it help get him chosen for Jaws based on that? I think that Jaws, yeah, Jaws was uh, the feature film, the theatrical release that really was his big, uh, his big intro into Hollywood circles. Duel definitely helped to pave the way for that. And you see a lot of early hints of what Jaws would eventually become, the whole notion of this unseen menace pursuing these people with no rational explanation as to why. A lot of the camera angles that he uses to build the momentum, uh, the use of lighting and shadows, you certainly see a lot of this. Uh, you certainly see a lot of this uh, in this film, in Duel, that he really, with a bigger budget, was able to bring full circle. The other, the, thing I saw about this, yeah, the other thing I saw about this uh, was that, I think I read it was like one of the first times that he was sitting in the car and they were actually filming the chase scenes from inside the car. Whereas in the past, a lot of these, you know, scenes, they were, they were, they were sitting in a car in a studio and they, you know, they had the, uh, the, the background moving more. So did you see that? Have you seen that? Did you read that? Uh, no, I haven't. I didn't see any of that, but uh, I do know that a lot of the film was shot on location. Um, I'm sure that there were some, there were certainly some studio sets as well. At the very beginning of the film, you have him, uh, le you know, leaving his home, and so yeah, I'm, I'm sure it was a mixture of both studio yeah. constructed sets as well as as well as uh, location footage. But yeah. speaking of location footage. We mentioned Jaws, 1975's Jaws. This is the movie that really launched the still present notion of the summertime blockbuster, the movie that becomes the event movie of a summer season when in times past, uh, movie attendance usually is at its peak. Of course, times being what they are, uh, this is a season that's unlike no other, but that's a story for another day. Um, let's take a look at the trailer for Jaws, the original trailer, before we talk about the film. Yep. There is a creature alive today who has survived millions of years of evolution without change, without passion, and without logic. It lives to kill. A mindless eating machine. It will attack and devour anything. It is as if God created the devil and gave him jaws. <laughs> This is Universal's extraordinary motion picture version of Peter Benchley's best-selling novel, Jaws. I just found out that a girl got killed here last week. And you knew it. You knew there was a shark out there. You knew it was dangerous. But you let people go swimming anyway. <laughs> that most people get attacked by sharks in three feet of water about 10 feet from the beach yeah what we are dealing with here is a perfect engine uh an eating machine we're not only going to have to close the beach we're going to have to hire somebody to kill the shark bad fish but i'll catch him and kill him did you hear your father out in the water now this shark swallow you whole ah! you're going to need a bigger boat That's a 20 footer. 25. Three tons of them. Hurry up, he 
Please come inside the water. Don't screw it up now. Don't wait for me. Now! Shoot! fantasies of evil can compare with the reality of Jaws. Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, Richard Dreyfus, Jaws. See it before you go swimming. Pros really have changed, haven't they? <laughs> that gives away a lot of the film's uh, best moments. Yeah, I was going to say the, the two great things about that movie for me was the opening music. The, the, you, you, you cannot forget that. Just da 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 Throughout, like the first part of the movie, without ever seeing it, and how the suspense keeps building and building and building, and, and they focus on the kids in the water, so that you know that it's just, it's there, but you don't know when it's going to strike. So it's just, it's just amazing how he knows how to build suspense and create suspense and locks you into it, then terrifies you when you see it. <laughs> well, it's interesting because. I don't think this is Spielberg's, like the shark, <laughs> shark patrol. <laughs> yeah. This isn't um, the Spielberg. I, I would, I would dare say, I mean, arguably, that this is not the Spielberg who makes films now. By that, what I mean is, back then, he seems to be focused more on really the the bare bones of of the plot. Uh, this was based on a novel by Peter Benchley, and the novel had a lot of subplots that Spielberg just left out of the screenplay, left out of the film version, which is not to the film's detriment at all. Um, it's just telling the story in a different way. I think that he tends to pad his films more these days, but Jaws is the first, and speaking of the music, Jaws is the first of a long line of collaborations between Spielberg and John Williams. This is actually John Williams. He won the Academy Award for Best Musical Score for Jaws. The movie also got Best Sounds and I think one other Oscar. But mm -hmm. it was the, it was not just a hit. It became a phenomenon. And to Spielberg's credit, Spielberg was not involved with any of the sequels, which got progressively more and more ludicrous. Which yes. tends to be the case anytime you have, yeah. <laughs> anytime you have too many sequels. Once a franchise is, uh, you know, sequels to death, then it reaches a point where it's, is there any redemption? But yeah. it doesn't take away from the power of the original. No, no, the the, the original was great. I mean, and the, and the second, another best part of that too was, was having the chief be afraid of the water, and he's the one that's going to be on that boat and is going to have to like find a way to kill the shark. Uh, I shouldn't even say that. People haven't, you know, some people won't see it. Like I have friends, we live on, you don't live on the Cape, but my in-laws are on the Cape. And you know how the, the shark scares, especially in the most recent years and in the, in, the, in the summer. I mean, we went to a beach last year and they had a sign. I should have, I should have saved it where it says, beware of sharks. And, and my wife will never, ever watch this movie. There's a lot of people don't want to, and I have a friend also, that will never watch the movie for the same reason because he loves going in the ocean. He doesn't want to know. <laughs> he doesn't want to see it. Yeah, I don't know. Do you have people like that? I mean, that's the kind of impact it had on people. It still does. I think anytime you have a movie that appeals to any basic human fear, whether it's fear of you know the more dangerous side of nature like Jaws uh, or yeah. even with Duel, like fear of strangers fear of being alone and vulnerable uh yeah. at the mercy of someone who is physically more intimidating than you are someone dangerous yeah. someone sociopathic i think that's what is the key to a lot of what makes 
uh, these kinds of movies work is that they appeal to a, a commonality, a very a very fundamental part of human nature, something that we something that is unknown, something that we cannot control. Right. Um, and that carries over into the next film we're going to take a look at. Let's take a look at the trailer for a film that he released three years after Jaws, 1978, one of my personal favorites, Me Close too. Encounters of the Third Kind. Have you recently had a close encounter? A close encounter with something very unusual. Who are you people? The, the, the casting in this movie, um, I love Richard uh, Richard Dreyfus as Roy Neary, and the way really focusing on him. I mean, the kid the kid, the kid in the movie was fantastic too. In fact, I heard uh, Spielberg say that he actually thought of it as a fa as a fable, like a, a thing where kids you know are so innocent and full of wonder that they would not he wouldn't think twice, if, you know of opening a door if there's something strange, like a light coming through the house. And, um, he, you know, he, he, he was just, it was just amazing how, how, the, how he had all these people been touched by a uh, experience that was not normal. And they, and, and they, and that's why the close encounters of the third kind is actually making contact with an alien being. And they were saying that when the movie first came out, that people didn't understand what's the title mean? What's that all about? But he has said, I know I'm kind of wanting going around, but he had said that um, he's always believed that there are UFOs out there and uh, actually did a lot of research with a scientist on this um, to, to get his input that it, who also had, was investigating UFOs um, and couldn't find the explanation for about 10% of them. And so he had him as a, um, as, as like a, a person to help with on the, on, on the, on the film. And so, um, but you know, it all came out of his imagination, which is just amazing, isn't it? Because he wrote it as well. Yeah, um, it's a film that is probably among the more grounded of his so-called popcorn flicks because it is a film that it takes itself pretty seriously. He did his homework. He worked with scientists. He did his research. He interviewed people who claim to have had these kinds of encounters with what the film refers to as the intergalactic family. Um, people who believe uh, ufologists today, they still hold this film up all these years later. 42 years later, as um, a prime example of how Hollywood, on that rare occasion, sometimes does get it right. Um, just in terms of the, the dialogue, 
the scientists' theory, the characters of the scientists, the way they interact with each other as they try to, as different governments in the world try to work together to uh, to share knowledge as opposed to being, you know, different factions, having them come together, uh, a challenge really for any era, you know, having the whole world come together to be on the same team. Yeah. There's a lot of humanity in this movie. There's a lot of humanity. Um, it's not yeah. all, you know, visual. I mean, yes, there are visual effects, but it's not all, uh, the visual effects do not drive the story. It is no. a story about, it is a story about people. It's a story about life. And it's a story about life really in all areas, not just on this planet, but you know, but all over, throughout all of creation. Spielberg was hesitant to have Richard Dreyfuss in the lead role because they had worked together in Jaws. And although they liked each other and had a good rapport, um, he wasn't, Dreyfuss wasn't the first choice. Al Pacino was off of the role. He said no. Uh, Dustin Hoffman was off of the role. Steve McQueen was off of the role, but apparently he felt that he couldn't cut it because he was unable to cry on cue as yeah. the script would, as the script would have him, would have his character do. Yeah. Uh, so Richard Dreyfuss, and as you said, Richard Dreyfuss said to Spielberg, Richard Dreyfuss said to Spielberg, um, you need a, you need an actor who is capable of projecting a sense of childlike Wanda, and that's really what led to Dreyfus's uh, nabbing his second leading role yeah. in the Spielberg film in three years. Yeah, he said he was more like an everyman, like he could like relate to like anyone who watches this would put himself in his position, you know, could see himself you know reacting the way he did, and he does have that kind of a quality, I think. The other thing that, too, that's, like you said, is very grounding about the is how the government was trying to dissuade, you know, make make up some kind of story about what was going on at that Devil's Tower where everything, you know, took place with the, you, with meeting the UFOs people. Um, but, um, yeah, so, so, so it was pretty accurate that way. They didn't want people to know about it. They were saying there was some kind of a poison or something around the, uh, the, the Devil's Tower there where they were meeting. And, um, and of course, you also got the idea for E.T. From, from that movie. But I, I don't know if we want, we don't want to skip ahead yet. <laughs> uh, before we get to E.T., there is one yeah. of this uh, film icon, an iconic character introduced to the world by both Spielberg and his longtime friend and collaborator, George Lucas. And this character was delivered unto us in the summer of 1981 in the film Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I speak, of course, of Indiana Jones. Yes, Indiana Jones is the man. So let's see that trailer because that's unmistakable. Three thousand years, man has searched for the lost Ark of the Covenant. The Bible speaks of the Ark leveling mountains and laying waste to entire regions. Not something to be taken lightly. No one knows its secrets. Jones, do you realize what the Ark is? It's a transmitter. It's a radio for speaking to God. An army which carries the Ark before it is invincible. The Ark. If it is there, Atanis, then it is something that man was not meant to disturb. It is protected by forces beyond imagination. It is desired above all treasures on Earth by those who are good, trust me, and those who are evil. I tell you everything. Yes, I know you will. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Let her go. Hey, we have no time. If you still want the Ark, it has been loaded onto a truck for Cairo. Raiders of the Lost Ark. 
A film from Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. say that opening sequence you can talk about the movie as well but i mean i went to universal they have a they have a ride for that that they built the, the raiders of the lost ark and they not a ride but it's a show where they actually recreate a a, a, a stump you know indiana jones escaping from the boulder and they have a whole setup for it so i mean they took that opening sequence and made it into an exciting you know show at universal for that but i mean that is not that's got to be one of the most iconic scenes ever. When you watch it for the first time, you're going, what is going to happen next? You know, will he, how can he get out of that? It, it, it just, it, it's like one of the greatest um, action adventure movies I think I've ever seen, even since I was a kid. And, I, you know, they've done others, which have also been very good. But I still think the original is, I mean, it's the best. Yeah, I mean, to give credit where credit's due, the whole idea, the concept of the story actually came not from Spielberg, but from George Lucas. The two of them were vacationing together in Hawaii, and they were lying on the beach, you know, and Spielberg was, you know, and George Lucas got stood up in front of him and got all excited as he was pitching this, this story idea to him that in his mind, his vision was that it was going to be a throwback to those Saturday morning serials that the two of them grew up with. So yeah. the whole uh, swashbuckling spirit of adventure, the cliffhangers, the stunts, uh, stunt stunt pieces, all of this was part of the uh, part of the package for them. So Spielberg was right on board with this idea, and together they collaborated. They hired Lawrence Kasdan to write the screenplay, who had uh, worked with Lucas on the original Star Wars trilogy. And you have Raiders of the Lost Ark, which was, of course, at this point, we cannot picture anybody else but Harrison Ford playing this role. But it was a production that at one point was very closely linked to Tom Selleck, but alas, Tom Selleck was unable to get out of his contract uh, for the television series Magnum P.I. He was unable was to take the necessary job. time off in order to do the film, so he lost the uh, he lost the role. Yeah, did George Lucas not want, he didn't want Harrison Ford to do it because he said, this is my Star Wars guy, this is my Han Solo. And, yeah, and pretty much, Robert, you know. Yeah, Spielberg said he's perfect. He, I don't know, maybe from watching that. But but Indiana Jones was that the the, the name that Lucas gave? Is that was that Lucas's whole story too as well that he gave to uh, Spielberg? Well, the interesting story the interesting story behind how they came up with the name of this character um, it actually relates to Chewbacca from Star Wars. Uh, Lucas created the character of the Wookiee, Chewbacca. And he said that the Wookiee was very much based on the dog he had at the time. And the dog's name was Indiana. Oh. So that's where uh, the name Indiana Jones comes from. Now, where the name Jones comes from is anybody's guess. Probably just to, yeah. you know, to have it be a name that would be monosyllabic and just have a good flow for the title. Um, but it was, yeah, uh, it was it was Lucas's dog who was the uh, the namesake. Yeah, you know the other Character. thing I I, read, I I saw about this, like I saw an interview with uh, Spielberg, and he said Indiana Jones is like what every young American, you know, I don't know at the time, boy or whatever, a young kid, let's put it that way, wants to grow up to be a hero like him, you know. So that's like their hero, but obviously that's not what our lives are going to, you know, their lives are going to be. But that's who, the, you know, they, in their mind, in their imagination, that's who they aspire to be, is, you know, Indiana Jones, the hero, the great American hero. Yeah, well, you have to have an actor playing the part with, you know, 
the required amount of charisma, you know, screen magnetism. Yeah. He has to he has to be, you know, rough and tough around the edges, not afraid of, you know, a lot of physical physical stunts, physicality. Um, but in the same respect, he also has to have sort of a uh a snarkiness about him, that sarcastic, brittle edge. And uh, let's face it, has to have a certain amount of sex appeal as well. And at the time, Harrison Ford was completely in his prime. And, uh, you know, you do certainly see some similarities between the way he approaches the character of Indiana Jones and the way he approaches a character like Han Solo, sort of that self-assured, you know, cockiness. But I would say that Indiana Jones has more of the... uh, Indiana Jones has more of the humanitarian edge to him. He's all about his museum. He's loyal to his friend Marcus Brody, and uh, you know he certainly, you know, he, he has that he has that side to him. And then but, he has uh, a love interest. He has a love interest with uh, Karen Allen. Karen Allen is Marion, Marion Ravenwood. Uh, but of course, I'm now going to contradict myself with what I just said because uh, there is also the question raised in the film of what is he willing to sacrifice in his per, you know, in, in terms of his personal life in order to, in order to obtain the quote unquote one true act of the covenant, as they call it in the film. And uh, so, you know, is he willing to sacrifice somebody's safety in order to reach this act? And the answer, I think, would probably surprise a lot of people who would automatically assume that for the character of Indiana, or Indy as he's called, that uh, that people come first, because that might not necessarily be the case, which I think adds a certain, uh, it adds an additional dimension to the character that I find very, uh, very appealing, gives it a little bit more substance. Yeah. He's not afraid to do anything. It's a, not afraid of any of the, uh, the the second the other favorite scene in that movie too was like when the guy has the scimitar, the Arab, the uh, must be an Arab, and he's flashing the scimitar all around like he wants to have a fight with him in the bullwhip, and uh, he takes out the gun and shoots him. <laughs> oh, yeah. that was an ad lib. Yeah, uh, that, that right. was an ad lib during rehearsals because uh, Harrison Ford. I don't know if it was the flu or I don't think it was the flu, but it was some. He was sick with something. Maybe it was dysentery. He was running a fever that day. Um, he was just not <laughs> in a good place. And they had initially choreographed this whole fight sequence. And uh, you know, if you take a look at that whole sequence in the Cairo marketplace, that whole that whole uh, set piece where they. Yeah trying to you know trying to escape from the uh you know from the sword wielding uh yeah. bad guys the uh you can you can see all of these layers of sweat on his face which yeah it fits the scene perfectly but knowing that he was sick when he shot that particular sequence you know it it, it definitely adds some realism to it um so getting back to this uh choreographed piece uh, the story goes, I mean, who knows what was actually said, but as the story goes, uh, Harrison Ford turns to Spielberg and said, I'm really not up for this. Can we just, can we just shoot him? And uh, so they tried <laughs> it a couple of times. You know, it was all during rehearsal. They tried it a couple of times, a few takes, and they liked it, and they kept it in the movie. Wow. And it got one of the movies, it got one of the movie's biggest laughs. Yes, I think, and also one of the biggest surprises, probably as well. But um, now, now that we have totally let the cat out of the bag with it, for those people who have not seen the movie, uh, pretend that you didn't hear anything we just said. <laughs> yes, now this we should move on to the next movie, which is the uh, the the the, uh, the frightening movie, the, the 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 nightmare movie of a child like Spielberg, which is Poltergeist. <laughs> The house looks just like the one next to it, and the one next to that, and the one next to that. A young couple live in it. Give Ken a kiss. <laughs> you are so obnoxious. With their three children. <laughs> and something more. Sweetie, remember last night? Do you remember when you woke up and you said you were here? Uh-huh. Well, who did you meet? Who's here? TV people. Something's funny going on here next door. Something, uh, 
We were wondering if maybe you had experienced any disturbances lately. What kind of disturbances? I don't know what hovers over this house. Spielberg crosses a frightening new threshold into a world within our own. Its form is revealed. What is it? Its focus is clear. And the games are over. It knows what scares you. As unbelievable as it may seem, I would venture to say that Poltergeist might actually be, in terms of Spielberg's earlier work, one of his more one of his more personal films. Um, I remember seeing a behind the scenes retrospective and Spielberg's sisters were interviewed and they said that among Spielberg's worst fears when he was a little kid, he was definitely afraid of this tree outside of his bedroom window. Yeah, I saw that too, yeah. And he was also terrified of clowns, which is, I mean, let's face it, I think a lot of people are terrified of clowns. I mean, take a look at Stephen King's It, um, if you don't believe me. But uh, but yeah, clowns, the tree outside of his bedroom window. And so what does he do? He inserts both of those into this movie. Now, Poltergeist is the story of a typical suburban family, Southern California, an all-American family living in an all-American dream house, as the trailer put it. And... They soon find that their dream home is besieged by these poltergeists and these unfriendly spirits actually go so far as to kidnap their five-year-old daughter and bring her uh, incarnate into another dimension. And so the bulk of the movie is them obtaining help from paranormal investigators and psychics and mediums and a few twists and turns, some surprises along the way, which, of course, we will not reveal. Um, amazingly, the film was rated PG. Now, this was June of 1982 when it was released. It yeah. was not severe enough to warrant an R rating, I'm guessing the mindset was, but the PG-13 rating did not yet exist. So I think that it, depending on, you know, it's very subjective. People at the time probably saw Poltergeist either as a rather mild horror movie or something that was frightening and should have been an R instead of a PG. It was misrated, in other words. Um, yeah. Uh, I... I and they have some classic science, classic uh, scenes from that, like uh, when the little girl's looking at the TV and she goes, they're here. Um, I don't want to give away too much watching that movie either, but I didn't even know what poltergeist meant, but it actually means noisy ghost, according to you know, the definition of it. Um, in German, and, yeah. In German, yeah. so, you know, people look at what's a poltergeist, but yeah, so, but yeah, of course you can relate the most with the kids, I think as being, you know, scared, um, you know, the be, uh, their reaction is almost how you might react if you're a kid, you know, in the movie. And then the parents trying to make all sense of it. it. It was really brilliant too, because he does this a lot in some of his movies. He has people that were either unknown or hardly known so that you won't focus on them, but you are able to focus on what's happening, you know, on the action in the scenes. And uh, this is definitely one of those movies well, if you take a look at each of the films that we've looked at so far, Duel and Jaws and Close Encounters, uh, with the exception of Harrison Ford and Raiders of the Lost Ark, most of the leading actors at the time of these films' releases, these were not household names. 
Um, you know, we certainly can't say that Roy Scheider or that Robert Shaw were household names when Jaws was first released. Uh, but that's probably part of the reason I'm assuming why he was so hesitant to have Richard Dreyfus do Close Encounters because Jaws had been such a had been such a massive hit. But you're right with Poltergeist, you don't have. I mean, yeah, there were all experienced actors, but uh, you know, especially the adults. Uh, but with the exception of Beatrice Strait, who plays a paranormal investigator, she was an Academy Award winner for Network a few years earlier. Other than, other than she, uh, most of the cast really were, this was their first, yeah. you know, truly big hit. Of course, they've gone on to do other things. Craig T. Nelson, who plays the father, he went on to do the sitcom coach. Uh, so they all went on to do other things. But at the time of the film, they weren't, you know, you weren't distracted by the star quality. You were, the, the star of the film is this haunted home. And although the visual effects are, you know, <laughs> outdated by today's standards, which is not really a fair judgment because it happens, I would imagine, with any generation, you always look back and say, oh, wow, that's dated. But um, the visual effects were really the star of the show as well. Um, Pauline Kael, the film critic Pauline Kael, who had a reputation for being rather uh, blunt, and that's putting it mildly, uh, she paid a rare compliment to a film, to this film, to Poltergeist, calling it, quote, this is the movie that the Amityville horror wanted to be. Yeah, I saw that. Which was yeah. kind of a knock against the Amityville horror, but uh, hey, that's a film to look at another time. Poltergeist is Steven Spielberg's creation. Now, one last thing to say about Poltergeist is that Spielberg technically was not the director. He produced it. Uh, mm -hmm. The credited director of the film is Tobe Hooper, who had directed years earlier the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, of all things. Um, there has been some dispute. There has been some controversy and debate uh, since 1982, Toe Pooper's claims that Spielberg was a micromanager on set and that he would be there ostensibly to supervise, but really to sort of shove Toe Pooper aside and unofficially take the reins, if you will, and direct certain scenes himself. Yeah, I suppose and who knows what the, happens. Yeah, I know. I suppose he was looking at the dailies and he was like cha making changes. And they said that maybe Cooper would just be uh, Hooper would be sitting on the side, just like, just like hanging out, not really paying attention. So yeah, who knows? But the other thing about this too is um, the curse supposedly that happens from the poltergeist geist, poltergeist geist curse. Uh, with the the young actor, the one that the girl, the blonde, I can't think of her name. She died young, and the other one. Uh, was um heather or something right and then the other her sister was it this not the sister it was someone else that died young dominic dunn um, yeah um uh, certainly tragedy befell a lot of the uh cast uh untimely and in some cases violent deaths dominique dunn was an upcoming up-and-coming actress she plays the eldest daughter of the family and uh she was in a in real life in an abusive relationship with a boyfriend she had ended the relationship and this is long before stalker laws were a thing i mean this was you know this was when if you were a celebrity and you had issues with some, with an unwanted person uh really not leaving you alone you had very little recourse legally speaking um so uh so he did uh i mean we don't need to get into the details but basically yeah she was she was strangled by uh her ex-boyfriend who did not take the breakup lightly um and so the, she was killed i think it was around halloween so only a few months after the film was actually released uh she was cast in several other roles subsequently and so of course those roles were all recast so who knows what might have been had she lived what kind of a career she would have had um but then heather o'rourke who plays little five-year-old carol ann uh her story is that she did go on to do two sequels to this film She's the only cast member. She's one of two cast members to appear in all three. And while they were still filming the third one, Poltergeist 3, uh, this was a good six years later, 
uh, yeah, no, she had, uh, she died of natural causes. I think it was something with her, I think it was an intestinal problem, something yeah, with her I think stomach. That's what I heard. Yep, yep, yep. Um, so they had to rewrite the ending and they reshot certain scenes. If you take a look at one of the closing shots of Poltergeist 3, um, it's fairly obvious that uh, it's not that it's not Heather O'Rourke, that it's a, a life-size dummy, a doll um, wow. wearing her uh, wearing her costume. That, which, that was a very that was a very sad thing. Um, so yeah, so of course, over the years, the media has speculated, you know, the E! True Hollywood story types, TMZ, you know, is there a curse if you do this film? Uh, there were a couple of additional cast members in the sequels who also died, uh, you know, prematurely. So the whole notion of, you know, is this, you know, is this a franchise to avoid? Poltergeist was remade in 2015, and fortunately, there have been no... Uh, tragedies to befall anybody who was involved in that film. Just the opposite, in fact, because the father in the remake was played by Sam Rockwell, who, of course, only a couple of years later would go on to become an Academy Award winner for uh, three billboards outside Evan, Missouri. And then he'd be nominated again the following year for playing uh, George Bush uh, yeah, yeah, in, uh, that's right. in uh, Vice, I believe it was. Yeah, I, I was don't... Vice? I, yeah, I... Some some sequels I'll watch, but some I won't, <laughs> because I just love the original, and I just wish that they would leave like movies alone. And 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 the second part of doing sequels is I know they're looking to make money, but uh, there's so many supposedly original great ideas out there that studios just don't go to, and God knows what we're missing because they're they're just insisting on redoing, rebooting, rebooting, rebooting. But anyway. They didn't have to reboot this. They went right from the same location to do one of the best, greatest fable shows of all movies of all time, and that has to be E.T. But we should see. In 1975, he directed Jaws. In 1978, he directed Close Encounters of the Third Kind. In 1981, he directed Raiders of the Lost Ark. And now, Steven Spielberg brings us E.T., the extraterrestrial. We will witness the arrival, the search, the desertion, the fear, the discovery, the friendship, I'm keeping him. The secret. The love. The warning. The signal. The mystery. The danger. The intrusion. The wonderment. The enchantment. The hope, the connection, has been made. Universal Pictures presents Steven Spielberg's E.T., The Extraterrestrial. Became the number one movie of all time, knocking Star Wars off the list uh, for a few years at least. But um, it was released exactly one week after Poltergeist. So 1982 truly was the summer of Steven Spielberg. Uh, E.T. continues Spielberg's fascination with the whole idea of extraterrestrial life. And it also reflects, like Poltergeist does, it also reflects a lot of Spielberg's own personal demons, his own personal uh, concerns, and his own personal... Uh, insecurities, uh, namely the fact that uh, Spielberg's parents had experienced a bit of divorce and he always had blamed his father for the divorce. And if you take a look at not just E.T., but also at Close Encounters, if you take a look at Jaws, if you take a look even at the sequels to uh, Indiana Jones with Sean Connery as his father, 
and even with the dramas like Lincoln, there seems to be this recurring theme of troubled father-son dynamics, uh, or at the very least, an unstable, or in the case of E.T., an absent father figure in the family. At the beginning of the film, it's established that the father has recently abandoned the family, left for Mexico with a girlfriend, and that's sort of a, a theme that carries over with the, ch with the children in the film. Uh, that's something that's sort of lurking in the background, in the shadows, um, throughout a lot of the film as they meet this extraterrestrial and, you know, develop a relationship with him. He sort of becomes this, uh, he sort of, in part, in a way, kind of sort of fills uh, that void for them. So E.T. is a very sentimental film. It's also a little bit darker than uh, some of us may remember from when we started in the early 1980s. I guess fairy tales have rougher edges, but uh, <laughs> some of them do. This is probably one of those. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, it's true. Um, but the, the re I think that what he said about it is that he thought of doing this when he did the, uh, the Close Encounters and he goes, well, what if one of those uh, aliens was left behind? And, you know, because they all went back on the ship in, 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 in uh, Close Encounters. He said, what would happen then? And so, you know, he made an incredibly great story about it. I mean, the, the, the kids want to save E.T. and the government wants to capture it. Who knows what? Dissect it like a frog or something, you know, look into it. Uh, and, the, and, and the kids befriend him. And, um, and, and, and just the way he, you know, he constructs it so that he somehow finds a way that he can contact, you know, his fellow aliens out in space. With, uh, it's just, it's ingenious the way he, this whole story was put together. And one of my favorite scenes by far is when the kids at the end there, I don't care if we're giving it away. If you, have, if you have to see it, you can see it more than once anyway. When they're escaping and he goes and goes into the, into the nightlight and the bicycle like goes past the full moon. Uh, and that's like, you know, it's just it's just an amazing scene. It's just like a, in your imagination, that's the kind of imagination that a kid would have, you know, to get away. And then, you know, when he finally does manage to contact the others and and, and get away <laughs> at the end. But um, yeah, it's just a genius movie. I, I don't think there's anything been quite like that ever. You know, uh, as, as ingenious as Close Encounters where I think they're almost like match pairs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're running out of time, so yeah. we do have one last film to take a look at, and that is 1993's Jurassic Park. Since the beginning of time, Man has searched the earth for evidence of its past. But while some have looked for clues to the mystery, one man has found the way to bring the mystery back to life. I own an island off the coast of Costa Rica. And I spent the last five years setting up a kind of biological preserve here. On this private island, science has defined evolution. Where do you get a hundred million year old dinosaur plot? Genetics has mastered creation. We have made living biological attractions so astounding that they'll capture the imagination of the entire planet. And extinction is a thing of the past. Welcome to Jurassic Park. We got it where King Kong. None of these attractions are ready yet, of course, but the park will open with the basic tour you're about to take. Hey, look at this. You see something? Dinosaurs and man, two species separated by 65 million years of evolution, just been suddenly thrown back into the mix together. How can we possibly have the slightest idea? You feel that? What to expect? Things are failing all over the park. Phones are out too. Gotta go. Universal Pictures presents. I 
can't get Jurassic Park back online. Adventure 65 million years in the making. Just a delay. After all, it is all major theme parks have delays. When they opened Disneyland in 1956, nothing worked. But John, if the Pirates of the Caribbean breaks down, the pirates don't eat the tourists. You sure we're safe? Yes. I must have figured out how to open doors. Jurassic Park. So, Jurassic Park, big budget, box office spectacular, spawns an entire franchise, which is still with us now. Uh, it's now been rebooted as Jurassic World, and there's a new one that is currently in the works. So, we'll see where that franchise leads. But, unfortunately, we are out of time. So, uh, Mike, you want to thank the dinosaurs for, Yeah, I want to thank the dinosaurs for being in that movie. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank uh, Frank, Frank Mendoza. I want to thank... Uh, Mike and Dave and everybody at Smack for putting the show on. We want to thank Steven Spielberg for making some fantastic movies that we all uh, uh, love to enjoy. So for next time, uh, this is Mike Wigdor from Real Life, and uh, we'll see you next time on our next exciting episode. Thank you, everyone.